So again, welcome, welcome. Uh, nice Thursday morning. Thursday with the crew. Um, let's do some Logic Pro X work today. Uh, again, we're going to open up our project that we had worked on yesterday. Um, and this particular project, again, was our uh, skills winners back in 2017. Um, they completed this nice, beautiful one, two, three, four, five part um, project that was supposed to be exactly, and I forget what the total length was. What was the total length? Get over here. It's somewhere back here. Let's see if I can get up there. About 3.30. Okay, so it's exactly 3.30, which is what they had to do at the national level. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so anyway, um, we're going to talk about a couple things today. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about at length is our patches. Uh, not Patches Old Houlihan from the movie Dodgeball, which was an excellent movie, but rather patches found over here in the library. So I added a brand new MIDI track to this. Now, remember, these guys did not do any MIDI in their project. Everything was uh, loops and edits and cuts and stuff like that. So nothing here is MIDI. Not to say that you can't add a patch to an audio track, but we're going to just start a new MIDI track just to show you the power of the patch. So I go into my library and I say to myself, hmm, I want an instrument for my software instrument track. Now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, choose from one of these. Let's just make it easy and say piano. When I click on piano, it gives me my options for my piano. I got um, very specific brand name pianos that have a very specific sound. And then at the very end, I have this experimental one, which adds a lot more plug-in work to it when I put it on the track. Let me pull up my mix window and show you what's going to happen to this track and the project when I add my patch. Okay. So I go ahead and click on my track. I'm going to go ahead and click on, let's say, Ghost Piano. So now you can see my track has changed to a piano uh, icon with the Ghost Piano. But let me show you more importantly what happened over in the mixer. So you can see now there's a lot more going on. Let's take a look at it and break down the mixer, even as a review for tomorrow's test, because part of, parts of the mixer will be on the test. And as you can see, they're all labeled here. I have it labeled so you can see all the parts. So we'll go up to our setting, which we talked about a little bit. Our setting actually comes from this huge sample library. And that setting then also contains information about the track, its busting, its sends, and of course, all of its plugins and all the plugin settings. So let's take a look really quick at our EXS24, which absolutely is the input software instrument for this track, meaning to say this is where they're generating the sound. So if I pop into this really fast, uh, let me just let uh, see Deja in here. Um, if I were to pop into the EXS24 list, you'll see here are all the samplers available to you in Logic. A lot of them, right? And there's also third-party ones that I have installed on here. So things like Native Instruments and UVI and XLN um, and Waves and Sound Toys and all these other things. Um, but the ones that come with Logic are right here in the main list. And the XS24 is where we're going to get our ghost piano from. And then it go ahead and gives you all these plugins. So here's the amp. So pretty cool. It's actually an amplified piano sound. So very, um, let's say, electronic. Uh, we have our EQ. Again, all the settings are here for the EQ. Someone had to sit here and develop all this. We have our... Um, ensemble, which is almost like a, a chorus, but with like some sort of um, low frequency sweepers and modulators and oscillators. So that's probably what it's going to give me the ghosty sound. Um, I have a, a compressor on this, I guess, to kind of hold back and restrain some of the sound or really squish it so it sounds pretty consistent throughout. I have a ghost piano delay on this. Now, this isn't my choice. This was something Logic did, but it's something that I probably wouldn't do myself, is they actually put a timed delay directly on the track. Now, why did they do that? Well, I guess because before you send it out to those other two auxiliary tracks for more effects, they wanted to make sure that you had some sort of delay to give it that ghost piano idea. Remember, this is the whole point of this is to have this really weird, wacky, ghosty sound. All right. Uh, then they added two different buses. Bus one travels next door to a brand new 
uh, auxiliary track that was created for you once you selected the patch. And on that bus one, auxiliary one, uh, I have a chorus, but it's grayed out, meaning it's not active, which means I could activate it and see what happens to the sound. It has a space designer on it, which we will talk about plugins in a week or two. Uh, but this space designer plugin is all about reverb. And this one is a villa bathroom. So you can imagine it's probably very large and reflective. And then they put a post EQ on this, which is just flat. There's not much there. So for the most part, um, you know, there's nothing crazy in the back end, the final end after the reverb for the EQ. Okay, bus number two is released a little more, as you can see. This is a little bit, and this is a lot of it. And this one is a little different, probably has a Prince Hall on there. So it's probably even bigger than the Villa bathroom. And then their EQ at the back end is just another balancing EQ. So these two that were added at the back end are just to help balance out if things change a little bit in the reverb plugin, in the space designer plugin. All right, now all three tracks, all three of these tracks are gonna feed my main output. So I'm gonna get the piano with all these effects, a copy of that piano with these effects to these two channels and an output of all of that. So three different piano sounds are gonna come out of this. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use my keyboard, this guy right here, very quickly to play some sound. You can hear it's very spacey, very uh, open, very, a lot of reverb is happening in the project and in there. So let's, while we're doing that, take a look at how my outputs are acting inside the mixer. So you can see a lot of the signal that's going through the main is going to be coming from the original track. A little bit of the signal from the reverb and a little more of the signal from this other long reverb. One's a small room and one's a large room. So you're going to get these two different reverbs playing off each other. Right? So that's kind of what a patch can do. It'll set everything up for you in order for you to, hey, it's an audio production. Who is this? Who named their phone or their thing audio production? Who are you? Audio production person, I unmuted you. Yes, you just joined. Who is that? Yes, you just joined. Who is that? You can't see the word. No, I'm not looking at the video. Just tell me who you are so I can rename you because audio production doesn't work right. Uh, really good connection. I can't understand a word you're saying. All right, so just question, question mark for right now until I can figure out who the heck you are. All right, moving on. Um, so yeah, our keyboard just allowed me to kind of quickly go ahead and make some notes and you could hear how the patches worked very well. Nope, still digitalized. Someone has bad Wi-Fi. And a delay. Jeez Louise. Oh, well. Um, anyway, so this patch, this particular patch of Ghost Piano, um, really helped me figure out what was going on. It's something that would take me quite a while myself to build. And that's why patches are so easy and so awesome to use because they have so many things they do for you. And on the other end, if I just didn't like the ghost piano sound and I just wanted to change it, how easy would it be just to select another one? You know what? Ghost piano is too much reverb, too much information. Let me just select a standard Steinway. Let's take a look at the track here. You're back unmuted. What do you need? Nothing? Oh, great. Whoever that is, is in a big delay. So they are hearing me just seconds after I talk. All right. So even our Steinway piano, right, um, still has a lot of stuff going on. Our Steinway piano has an EXS24 sound generator. Great. That's our piano. Um, a channel EQ, a compressor, and a tape delay. Tape delay I'm not fond of because, again, it is timed effects. But it probably plays a vital role in the total sound. So that's why it's on the track itself. Not something I would build personally, but definitely something they did. So let's take a look at what else it does. It, it actually breaks out buses just like the other one. And both buses have the reverb on there. I'm going to assume one's long and one's short. They love doing that. 
and they love feeding just a little bit or a lot of it in each one. So let's take a listen to the Steinway and the difference of the sound. All right, there's a little bit of tonality in the environment. You can hear the air of the piano itself, but it also sounds extremely dry and in your face, unlike the other one. No, no, no. I hit R for record. And there's a little bit of reverb in that room. Not a lot. So, uh, again, looking at the mixer, um, you could see that when I play it, uh, let's go back to that so I can have my keyboard up. There's not much happening in the small hall, and it's really only a little bit of the large. And what I'm getting at the master output now is the Steinway piano with its effects from this track and a little bit of it copied over here to the space designer to just give it that bit of time and space and air. That's important to this sound. Um, if I go to piano and upright bass, things change as well here. So let's uh, take a look at what happens to the patches here. Um, good, I have a piano. On the low end, I have a bass. If I octave up a little bit, I have a piano. So you can see I'm octaving up and down the piano. So this octave triggers the piano where I could do my, and then if I octave down, I have my piano and my bass is right there. So this splits the piano in half, half of it would be upright bass, half of it be piano. Well, how do they do that? That's the question. Well, again, it all stems from a plugin that is a patch inside of the software. At this point, you could tell that I do not have, oh, let me get out of this. I do not necessarily have the, um, the same setup as I did before. If I look at my piano, my piano on upright bass, there's my setting. So where's my plugin? Where's my generator? Where's my EXS24? Because when I pick Steinway, then you can see my EXS24 popped in here. But when I picked upright bass and piano, now my EXS24 is gone. And it's telling me that it's coming from a bus. Interesting. That's something, that's a very advanced routing um, technique that would take a while to master. But Logic actually takes it to the next level and lets you do it all on your own by just simply clicking on one of the patches in the library. I think this is one of the reasons why people really do love Logic. Now, let me break this out. I want you to notice that there is a little arrow right down here on the track. And this kind of brings us into our next uh, idea of what a track stack is. So let me break that out for a second so you can see what's going on. So check this out. Inside of this quote unquote track stack are two individual instruments. One instrument is a piano. You could see it right here where it says piano. And one instrument is an upright bass. So in combination, these two tracks are feeding this one track here. All right. And so what does that allow me to do? Well, that allows me to do what I was showing you before. That on a low end, I have the bass. And if I octave up, I have the piano. So this track stack is actually a combination of two individual software instrument tracks, one containing a piano, one containing a bass, and then they split the octaves on the keyboard, on the 88 key um, layout. And again, I'm not using my MIDI keyboard here yet. I'm simply using the interface of the computer to give me a keyboard, but you could still get the idea of how it's split into two separate instruments. Now, this little arrow actually allows me to break out those instruments to hide and reveal them. But I also want you to see over here in the edit window that they also got broken out with the little arrow. I don't know if you could see it, but there's a little arrow right here in the track. Click that arrow, 
and now you can see both instruments individually. This setup is called a track stack. Now a track stack uh, is or can be very, very uh, elaborate and have a lot of different tracks within it. And on a case like this, it could be very simplistic where you're just splitting octaves on a keyboard. Some will go to this instrument, some will go to that instrument. Again, if you look over here on the actual mixer, both of these instruments are being generated by the EXS24 sampler, the, the software that actually creates the sound. Uh, and then the piano has a little tape delay. The bass is very dry, but both are feeding through this EQ comp and both could get bussed out four and five to the space designer and the EQ. So there's a lot of signal changes that were made in here. A lot of signal things that, again, on a very basic level would be very difficult to create from scratch. But allowing logic to go in and change things is uh, really helpful. This is something where it takes you from that amateur person to that um, intermediate to expert level without having to have the knowledge of signal routing. Very, very cool. Um, so let's, let's break these out. You know, maybe I don't want them to be in two, sep uh, two tracks being in one track, meaning I don't want this to look like this. I want to break this out. All right. Now there is a way you can separate these track stacks. We're going to do both creating and separating, but since I already have one created here, let's separate them out. So if I right click or command click on the track, I can go to something called flatten stack because this is a track stack and I want to flatten it out. Watch what happens when I do that. Both of those instruments inside of the track break out into their own thing. So now when I go here, I have only piano. And if I select on the upright bass, uh, I have to octave down a little bit. Come on, octave down. Just because it's a low instrument, so it's only going to be low. But you can see that now, yes, I do have the software instrument there. By itself, no piano. No piano. The piano is separate. The bass is separate. Two separate tracks. So if I like the two sounds that are within that one instrument that I had before, the piano and upright bass split track, I can actually break them out into their own tracks. If I wanted to put them back into a track stack to make it look like this again, and you see, whoop, to make it look like this again, to make it look like a track stack, all right, let's do it. Let's break it out. Let's flatten it out. And now let's create our own. So again, I'm going to select the tracks that I want to be within the track stack. Right now, I'm just holding down shift and I'll select the second one. Right click and go to create track stack. And there are quick keys for both of these. So it's command shift D to create it or command shift U to uncreate it. All right. Those are in the notes today, by the way. They were in the notes on the Google Classroom. Let's go to create track stack. So it's going to ask you a couple of options for how you want to create the track stack. You can create it in a folder, which is nice. It basically takes these two tracks and makes one track in a folder. Or you can make a summing track, which is exactly the way it was created using the patch. So let's do the created of the patch. And you can see, look at that. Piano upright bass goes right back to the track stack that we had. Let's do it the other way just to show you the difference. So Command Shift D, and I want to make a folder stack, create. And you can see now that it's showing you sub one, and it's not really a sub, but it kind of is. It's a sub mix of those two instruments. Still gives you the little arrow that you can drop down and see the two instruments in. Let's take a look at what it looks like over in the mixer. And wow, it looks a little weird, right? It looks like a blank track where you can't add plugins. You can't add sends. There's no available things to do other than automation. But if I wanted to break them out in the mixer, again, hit that arrow, and there it is, the two different tracks that were in my track stack. So to summarize this yet again, you can create track stacks in two different ways. First way is by using, let me go back to this. There we go. First way is by using a track stack as a summing track, which is what the patches do. 
again, command shift D to create it. A summing stack allows you full access to all three tracks in the mixer. So I can not only add plugins to the initial blended track right here, so applying effects to both, but I also have access to individual tracks. In a folder, you don't have that. In a folder stack, uh, Command Shift D, you're only accessing the two tracks as individuals. Again, going in here, you'll see that it creates this subtrack. I can't add any plugin work or sends, but I can, of course, get to the individual ones. So, very cool ways of utilizing um, these breakouts, uh, being able to create a track flatten a track, um, break things out. Let me show you an even more practical way, and I'm going to just delete these tracks for a second, okay? We don't have to only do these with MIDI. That's the key here. This is just track by track regardless of the track. So let's do this. Let's go back to our original project. Let's select the first three tracks here, one, two, and three, and let's create a track stack just for these tracks. Why? Because they're the intro interview. They're colorized to mean a first section of a project. Command Shift D gets me into my track stack. Um, let's just pick folder for now because folder is easy. And look at that. It actually simplifies what's going on. I can actually come in here and rename this again, intro uh, slash interview, right? I can still access the three tracks. There they are using this little arrow dropdown, but it simplifies my project just a little more. And especially if I'm working with, and so this is where it starts to get more um, uh, useful is let's say I had about 14 drum tracks, which is not uncommon. 14 drum tracks seems like a lot. And it also will take up a tremendous amount of real estate in your edit window. So if you are good with your drum tracks, still want some access here and there to do quick edits or whatever, but you want to clean up your edit window space by eliminating tracks. Well, of course you can use the hide feature, but then you got to reveal it and bring it back and view it. Here, it's just quick access with one simple click. What we're doing is essentially we're just condensing down some of the tracks that are there into individual sections. So let's do it for the next one. So the Disney commercial and the music, Command Shift D. We'll use folder stack. Of course, we'll label it Disney. Okay. Um, we'll go into our negative uh, news and uh, our interview with that. So we'll just call this one negative, Command Shift D. And we'll label this negative. Okay. We'll do our... Whoa. We'll do our sluggers, um, which is the Louisville slugger commercial. So I'll just like slug, command shift D, hit enter for that. And we'll just type this as slug. And then our outro, which is very easy, an easy track stack create, command shift D. And then we'll just call it outro. Okay, so see how much we've simplified our project. And all of these sections are accessible. This is cool. I, I, I use this, especially when I start cracking over, let's say, 20 tracks. When I start jumping over 20 tracks, this becomes a very important part of my workflow. Um, so again, I can still go in and access these sections, focus on these sections even, and not take up all these uh, tracks and, and real estate in my edit window to work with just these tracks. And so here they are there, then they are here. Here's the slugger. They're all there. Just being sure that the outro is there. Let's see what this looks like over in the mixer. Wow. Things got really condensed down, right? We used to have it where it was a bunch of tracks, almost filling the screen with tracks here in my mixer. But now, not so bad, right? I have a few different uh, sections, which I'll probably have to go back in and recolor now because they all take on a purple, uh, like a master color. So if I wanted to match them with color, uh, I'd have to go command C, uh, sorry, option C, my bad. Um, and then colorize this bad boy. And then, uh, Disney, I think was what, I'm going to move this yellow, green, blue. Okay. So then we'll go to Disney and colorize that as yellow. 
use green, use blue. And then the last one I believe was like a, a red, really, no purple, okay, purple. So there you go. I mean, it, it's not perfect because I didn't, you know, really match up colors exact, but it's relatively close. So now both in here in the edit window, I have my track stacks built colorized and then it matches it over here in the mixer so i know which ones i'm working with which ones go to which i am not saying you have to do this this is just a, a really good way of condensing down and simplifying your workflows so you don't have all these tracks to stare at and scroll through and move around these girls did a great job in initially organizing it anyway so i really can't argue with the way they had it the way it was when these tracks were all broken out but, um, you know, it could be better. It could be more condensed. And if they had to add uh, many, many more layers of things into this project, um, they would probably eventually have to get to this point where creating a track stack just makes a lot more sense, not only visually, but just workflow-wise, being able to jump around and do stuff within there. I'm going to just uh, very fast undo all of that um, because I don't want to keep it in that to show you the next thing. Uh, make sure I don't have my piano still down there. I do. Let me ditch my piano. Because I want to talk a little more about patches. Because they're fun. They're a good time. So let's, uh, again, we'll, come, we'll create a brand new track, uh, software instrument track right now. And let's get back into our patches really quick. Now, um, drums. Drums is something that I just mentioned before about when I'm creating track stacks. Um, audio drums, like real drums mic'd up with their waveforms in the project, um, what I'll do is I'll create a track stack out of those drums, no doubt about it. When I'm done and locked in with my drums, before I go into a true like last minute post-production environment, I will track stack those drums just so I don't have to stare at 14 tracks of drums. So let's get into the drums of the uh, MIDI patches for a second. So I'll we'll go into drum kit right here, and then we'll pick a Brooklyn kit. All right. Now you can see that this Brooklyn kit isn't broken out. There's nothing I can really access here um, in regards to track stacking. If I right click on it, um, I can create a tra track stack, but I'm only going to create one track and that's the Brooklyn track. What Logic did a few versions ago is they started to include the track stacked versions of the producer of these kits. So let me show you those. If I go down to the very bottom of my library and I go into producer kits, you'll see a lot of those same kits that were out over here, Bluebird, Brooklyn, Detroit, they're now in the producer kits. And they have this little plus after their name. This tells me that this is a track stacked drum patch. Let me show you. I like Brooklyn. Brooklyn's a great kit. When I click on the Brooklyn uh, producer kit. Now you can see on my track that there is a track stack. There's a little arrow right here. If I click on that, look at all the individual tracks. These are all the tracks that are available or all the sounds that are available to you in the drum kit. So, you can see over here in the mixer, the ones that I'm touching are acting like they were actually microphones on a drum kit. Now, at this point, unfortunately, I'm not going to have um, much access to those. Let's, let's record something just for fun. Okay, so I recorded that. Just something very simple with the metronome. I could probably go in and quantize that up. We'll talk more about MIDI editing later. Um, but you could see that the MIDI notes are appearing on only one track. All right. Now, this, this is where it starts to get a little crazy. Here's my MIDI clip. But we know that these notes are accessing overheads, kick in, kick out, snare top and bottom, hi-hats. If I touched the toms, it would have been tom working there. What happens when we break out this clip? Let's do it. Let's go right click, flatten track stack, or we can use the command shift U, which is what I'm going to use. Command shift U. Look what happens. It now gives me all of 
the tracks as individual tracks, both here in the edit window and also here in the mix window. And I can actually see now some of the EQ work that was done here on the kick, some of the EQ work that was done here on the snare. It's not much. You can see a little bit here. Some of the work that was done in limiting and EQing the toms. This is work that was done behind the scenes that you don't really get to see when you're using a normal patch. But when you're using a patch that has the ability to be a track stack, like the producer kits do, you can actually go behind the scenes and see how a professional would route, EQ, compress, and do things with drums. Very, very cool. Now, we're still back sitting here with just the signal on this track. Let's see what happens. Interesting. So I still do hear all the parts of the signal, right? I still hear the kick, the snare, even though the MIDI notes are only sitting on the overheads. Sorry, let me just, I just touched something here. No, go away. There we go. Let me go back in and, and undo that. Okay, and then we'll just move this back. I accidentally hit some things on my computer by accident. Let me just get back in there. We'll do our undo track stack. There it is, broken out. Like I said, our MIDI notes are here sitting on the overheads. And you'll also see that the overheads have a record button, but the other ones don't. So can I record individual MIDI notes on this new track? The answer is no, I can't. In fact, what's going on, and not to confuse you, but just to show you what's actually going on is that these tracks kick in and down below are all using something called external MIDI tracks that are accessing the signals that are coming from the overhead track. It's just another way of kind of messing around with it. And being able to do things like this uh, really do allow you some behind the scenes look. That's a little more advanced. We can talk about that if we get into um, deeper and deeper MIDI information, which we probably will have the time for. I want to show you, if I right-click on the clip here, this is also interesting. So if I go into MIDI, and I can go by separating by MIDI note or pitch or MIDI channel, this is also very interesting. Let's see what happens here when I click on separate by MIDI channel. Nothing happened there. Nothing happened there. Maybe I clicked the wrong, did I not click it? Oh, there it is, sorry. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so there it is. I'm in a producer kit. I'm gonna review this for a second. I'm in a producer kit, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the notes I created here, again, in here, which is just kick and snare, right? And I'm going to break those notes out into their individual drum parts. So I'm still in my track stack at this point. And I'm gonna right click, go to MIDI, and separate by note and pitch. When I do that, it actually takes what was up here at the top and puts all the notes to their instruments that they coincided with. And at this point, if I undo my track stack, command shift U, now the notes appear on their own individual tracks. That is a great way of working with MIDI drums. I like to see all my MIDI broken out into their individual pieces. Now this allows me to absolutely create notes all over the place. Very, very cool concept. So I'm able to then mix it like a real drum kit. I'll have a mic on a snare. I'll have a couple of mics on the overheads. I'll have a mic on the kick in and the kick out, the snare top, the snare bottom. I'll have all of those signals individually separated out on the tracks. So these are just advanced ways of utilizing some of these producer kits. Being able to start with a producer kit allows you then the breakout of the signal. Because usually when you start with a producer kit, it starts like this, right? And you're just kind of like... Then once you have notes written down and on that track, you can break them out and assign them to their individual pieces of the puzzle. If you never use the Tom Low, then it won't even make a difference. You don't have to worry about mixing the Tom Low. It never really existed. 
But if you have snare and kick information there, you can break that out and individually edit it on the MIDI clip. Again, right click, MIDI by note. And now if I double click on this, look, I'm only looking at snare information. That's it. There's no kick. If I go into this one, I have only kick information, no snare. So it gives you individual track uh, access to what each individual uh, signal was. This is a awesome way of working with patches. I'm going to delete that patch. Um, let's talk about the drummers because we just kind of spoke about drums a little bit. I mentioned that software instruments and audio we already did, talked about. Um, bass and guitar is not much different, although it is technically patches. External MIDI we just talked about, about MIDI tracks accessing other pieces of software generators. But what we didn't talk about is the drummer. So let's go into the drummer for a minute. And this is fun. Um, we'll do a little R&B. How about that? Well, when I create a drummer, what I'm doing is creating a technically MIDI pattern that's quickly converted to audio, set to the BPM of a project, and now you have access to make real-time changes to that MIDI and in turn make real-time changes to the audio and make the drummer feel like he's actually taking direction from you. Let's hear what's here. You're tuning into one of Hmm. Nice. Uh, let's say I want block party. Let's go back. You can see the audio changed. Yeah. Cool. What if I go into baby grand? Hmm. Now, down here in the drummer, you'll see that I'm just selecting these quick presets for this kit. Um, if I wanted to add instruments to the kit, I could. I'll throw in the toms a little bit and we'll put those into number two. See if he switches it up a little bit. Yeah. See now he's using, now he's using his toms. You don't have to have the toms there. You can get rid of them. You actually have the kick or the hi-hat gone as well. More percussion in there, whatever it is you guys want to do. A little, little hand clapping. Hmm. A little shaker. Here's a little tambourine. Cool. So basically, you know, the concept of this was from Logic that not everyone can find a drummer, right? Not everyone has the space or the time or the parents who have patience to allow someone to play drums in their room all day. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is what this became. It became this concept of how can we get our home-style home musicians to have some sort of drummer to play along with. And that's where this was. Um, and it's not really just limited to this. You can actually customize this even further beyond this. I don't want to get too deep into it, but I wanted to show you since this was one of the things I wanted to touch on when we just started talking about patches and drumming. Uh, over here, by the way, the library has changed. So you can select different people in the uh, R&B area. Um, you can actually change their kit on them. So like I said, I like the Brooklyn kit. Let me hear Rose playing modern R&B on a Brooklyn kit. No more tambourine. Put some cymbals in there. A little hi-hat. Very cool. So again, gives you very quick access to these parts and pieces. You can chop this up and do things uh, like in sections. So I don't necessarily have to have um, you know, this part there the whole time. I can actually just have it as the first four bars. And at this point, I could add a new section which could have completely different settings. Like I can get over into a heavy kit um, using uh, modern Motown. Yeah, I'm going to change the drummer up in a heavy kit and then see what happens. Oh, he's really rocking on those. Hi-hats. Oh, there it is. See? So you can have different styles and different clips of each thing 
Um, and that's really very cool. So then you can actually program sections of an intro, of a verse, of a chorus, and cut them up just like you would in normal MIDI and audio. Uh, this, if you guys are able to download Logic for free, I would play with this a lot. Um, I play with it and, you know, it's limited to what I do. I end up playing uh, very specifically uh, keyboard drums and then programming it and quantizing it and doing what I need to do for my stuff. But for someone who's just kind of taking on Logic for the first time, this is actually a really cool way of getting some sort of percussion musician in the room with you so you can play a guitar, play a bass, play a keyboard, uh, mess around with synthesizers. Um, very, very fun. Um, and I really appreciate that Logic is one of the uh, first softwares to do something like this, um, to have these producer kits and this drummer track available to you. Um, very quickly, again, I always like to show you what's going on beyond this. Um, take a look. So in the background, so over here in the mixer, what's happening on my drummer? Um, it is actually coming from a plugin called the drum kit. So drum kit designer. Um, and you can actually take that even further. And in here is called drum machine designer. And now we can really get into the nitty gritty of each individual piece of the puzzle. Every single filter, every detail of the sound can be edited. So I'm just throwing it out there because there is so much depth in this area of logic. Um, we're only scratching the surface right now, and hopefully, you know, within the next few weeks, we can really dive deep into some of this. But you can see I changed it over to, I got it out of the quote-unquote AI drummer, and I put it into now Drum Machine Designer, which gives me a little different uh, look and feel on what I'm doing. But again, very cool stuff that you can work with. So. Um, not everything that we just reviewed because I like to, you know, really go into depth since we have the time and I finally may have or may not have your attention as opposed to being in class. Um, there's some really deep areas of logic that we can go and I'd like to explore some of those, but not every one of those deep areas are going to be on the test on Friday. So before we, um, get out of here, I want to have anyone that has a question to ask their question so we can answer it for tomorrow's test. Uh, go ahead, Mike, what's up? Oh, actually, uh, I found my MIDI controller. You know, yeah. Scoop Art Catalog came in. Okay. What'd okay. you get? Oh, uh, if you look at my uh, camera, it's a keytar. It's 47 keys. Okay, hold please. Let me see. Look at that. You got look a keytar. I should buy that. Get out of here. You're gonna be like a that, that 1987, might... you're gonna wear checker pants and wear those big glasses? Mr. What's up, buddy? You didn't notice that was me earlier on that other computer, the audio production kit. Oh no, I it was all choppy. I didn't I couldn't understand. Nah, yeah, I wasn't home yet, so I used my friend's computer to jump on real quick. I have that's why I wasn't on lesson yesterday. Because okay. I went to the hospital, my friend died, so we what? went to check up. Yeah, he died yesterday. Was it the guy that got shot up in North Lindenhurst? No, it was some kid that um this comedian famous around. Um, town. He was famous for like what he was doing. Mm. He died of diabetes, so it was a shock to all of us. So I went to check on his mom to make sure she was okay. Gotcha. All right, yeah. no, no big deal. Um, but, I just um, didn't want to um, let you uh, d digitalize yourself out there, so I just dropped you down. Yeah. What is the basis that's going to be on the test this week, so I could look at like what notes should we look at? Well, of course, like I said at the start, at the start, and you weren't there right away. Um, okay. the, the notes that I put up on the Google Drive, mm -hmm. those notes will be there. I'm just going to mute you guys for a second. Um, those notes will be on it. Uh, so make sure you go through all those. My recommendation is just to copy them over. Um, and then, of course, the links that I sent you, the uh, Pro Tool, I'm sorry, Pro Tools, Logic X 101 stuff. I would watch that. You know, like I said, there's there's a lot of content in the last two weeks I put up on that. Google Classroom. So please make sure you go through it piece by piece. Um, all the notes are up there. So a lot of it is going to come from the notes. If you have last year's test with you still, then make sure you look at that. Um, what else do I want to say? I'll say this. Um, a lot of the lessons that we did this week have within the live lesson information about what's going to be on the test. Like I said, today I went pretty deep on a couple of topics. That really, you know, 
advanced stuff is not going to be on the test. It's mostly going to cover the stuff that you would typically see quick keys, uh, patches, um, the, the details about logic and the specs about how many tracks and, but very general, you know, like there's not going to be as specific stuff as I probably normally would have gotten to or would have put on the test. So it's just like the very, very, um, basic stuff in the end. That's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I've created, uh, most of it. I just wanted to see what I covered today and I'm just going to finalize that. And like I said, for you guys tomorrow, what's going to happen is, uh, we'll start up the class like we normally do at 10 o'clock. And then, uh, at 10 20, we will stop the zoom. And that way you guys can all log into your Google classroom. The test will be available to you at 10 20 tomorrow. And it will be closed out and removed by 11 o'clock. So you have to take it within that time. And trust me, it is not a very difficult test that you need that much time to do it. But yes, the, that's kind of what we're working towards right now. Um, and don't forget, don't forget, since we are 48 hours away, um, that you have two projects due tomorrow. And hopefully you've been working on those. Those two projects, 8C and 8D, um, and there has been people that have handed stuff in. I could see it here. Three people turned in C so far, which is great. Um, one person did D already. Um, again, project 8B is still late. 11 of you have not handed it in. In fact, this doesn't account for the whole class, by the way. Um, there's now 10 people not on our Google Classroom. Uh, so again, try to get the word out there if you can. We've done everything we can on our school end. And then when it comes down to it, unfortunately, people are going to be held responsible for not paying attention to the communication, ignoring the communication, or just not caring. And it will affect your grade. Again, speaking of grades, if you want your third quarter grade, uh, I have them. And just uh, either email me through Google Classroom, send me a message through Google Classroom, or DM me on the Instagram page. I've been sending a few out uh, throughout the week. And then tomorrow's our first test, so be prepared for that. Before we go, does anybody have any questions about anything? Nothing? No. All right. Uh, I have to say something. Oh, go for it. Uh, I found my MIDI controller that Ooh. I've been looking for. If you want to take a look at it. Yeah, let's let's take a look, Skeezy, here. Uh, better be, better you be better. you off right now, Andrew. Oh, I'm turning it on. This. It's okay. There you go. Ooh, whoa, wow, look at that thing. Looks like a Nike sneaker. It's an Akai MP yep. key mini. Nice. And where'd you, where'd you find nice. it? That's nice. I bought it online a while ago, but mm. I just never put it to use because the computer that I have now is just a piece Garbage. of crap, honestly. Yeah. yeah. But I'm getting a Mac. So nice. There you go. Oh, that's good. Tax returns are coming back. So right, tax nice. return money and get yourself something fun to play with for the next few months. Hey man, and uh, the thousand two hundred from Trump too. <laughs> oh yes, yes. If you are a wor working person and you're gonna get some Trump money, then you can spend it on that. There you go. I didn't All right, guys. I don't get Trump money. On. Yeah, well, what happened there is uh. All right. Uh, so yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, make sure you look over everything that's on that Google Classroom. Uh, I'm going to say all the stuff is going to be coming from that Google Classroom. So make sure that you review every video, every note, everything that I said from last week and this week, and be prepared for the test tomorrow. Uh, Mr. O'Toole signing off. We out. Peace out.